it was getting late and conversation was beginning to languish. The tobacco smoke had got into the curtains. The wine had got into the brains, which are liable to become heavy. And it was evident that unless somebody did something to rouse our spirits soon, the meeting would come to its natural conclusion and we, the guests, would speedily go home to bed and most certainly to sleep. No one had said anything remarkable all night. I mean, it may be that no one had anything very remarkable to say. I, I, I shan't go into further details, but we'd sat at table for several hours. We were bored. Yeah, yeah. We were tired and nobody showed a sign of moving. Somebody called for cigars and we all instinctively looked towards the speaker. It was Brisbane. A man of five and thirty years of age, strong man, little over six feet in height, moderately broad in the shoulder. He didn't look stout, but on the other hand, you, you'd never ever say that he was thin. He, his small head was supported by a, a strong and sinewy neck, and seeing him in profile, you couldn't help remarking the extraordinary breadth of his sleeves and the, the unusual thickness of his chest. He was one of those men who are commonly spoken of as deceptive, and that is to say, he was in reality very much stronger than he looked. I mean, of his features, I need say little, thin hair, blue eyes, large nose, square jaw. Everybody knows Brisbane. And when he asked for a cigar, everybody looked up at him. It's a very singular thing, he said. That thing about ghosts and perceiving that he'd attracted the general attention, he lit his cigar with great equanimity. People are always asking whether anyone's ever seen a ghost, aren't they? Well, I have. <laughs> Bosh, Brisbane! A chorus of derision greeted his statement. But there was a sense of relief, too, because it meant that the evening was saved. Eh? Brisbane was going to tell us a story, and Stubbs the butler suddenly appeared from the depth of nowhere with a, a fresh bottle of champagne. I'm an old sailor, as you know, said Brisbane. And as I have to cross the Atlantic pretty often, I have my favourites. Ships, I mean. I mean, most men have favourites, don't they? I, I've seen a man waiting in a Broadway bar for three quarters of an hour for a particular car that he liked. I, I think the barkeeper made one third of his living by that man's preference. Anyway, for myself, I have a, a habit of waiting for certain ships when I'm obliged to cross the duck pond. It, it may be a prejudice, but I was never cheated out of a good passage, but once in my life. I remember it very well. It, it was a, a warm morning in June. I, I hadn't much luggage. I, I never have. I've been mingling with the, the crowd of passengers and trying to avoid those chaps in blue coats and brass buttons who spring up like mushrooms from the deck of a moored steamer to obtrude their services on any independent passenger. Now, the Kamchatka was... One of these favourite ships. I say was because she emphatically no longer is. In fact, I, I cannot conceive any inducement which would entice me to make another voyage in her. But I digress. I got on board as soon as I could and I hailed a steward whose red nose and redder whiskers were equally familiar to me. 105 lower berth, please, I said to him. And I'll never forget the expression on his face. I mean, not that he turned pale. It's maintained by the most eminent divines that even miracles cannot change the course of nature. So I, I have no hesitation in saying that he, he did not turn pale. But from his expression, I judged that he was either about to shed tears, sneeze, or drop my portmanteau. And as the latter contained two bottles of particularly fine old sherry presented to me by my old friend Snigginson Van Pickens, I felt extremely nervous. But in fact, the steward did none of these things. He just muttered, well, I'll be damned, and led the way downstairs. I, mean, I suppose that he'd had a little grog, but I, I said nothing, and I, I followed him to the lower regions. Now, number 105 was on the, the port side, well aft, and there was nothing remarkable about it to look at. The, the lower berth, like most on that ship, was double, and there was plenty of room. The 
the usual washing apparatus. The question of towels, of course, was left entirely to the imagination. But on the mattresses were, were folded those blankets, which I've heard accurately compared to cold buckwheat cakes. The glass decanters were, were filled with a transparent liquid, faintly tinged with brown, from which an odour less faint but no more pleasing ascended to the nostrils, like a far-off seasick reminiscence of oily machinery. Sad-coloured curtains half closed the upper berth and the, the hazy June daylight shed a faint illumination upon the desolate little scene. God, I, I hate that room. Anyway, the, the, the steward deposited my traps and looked at me as though he wanted to make a quick getaway. He was probably in search of more passengers and more fees, I thought. Now, it's always a good plan to start in favour with his functionary, so I, I gave him certain coins there and then. I'll try and make you as comfortable as I can, he remarked as he put the coins in his pocket. But there was a, a doubtful intonation in his voice, which surprised me rather. I mean, possibly his scale of fees had gone up and he wasn't satisfied. But on the whole, I was inclined to think that, as he would have put it himself, he was the better for a glass. I was wrong, however. And I did that man an injustice. Now, nothing especially worthy of mention, occurred during the day. We, we left the pier punctually, and it was pleasant to be underway. The, the weather was warm and sultry, and the, the motion of the steamer produced a refreshing breeze. I mean, you, you all know yourselves what the first day at sea is like, I'm sure. People pace the decks and stare at each other. Occasionally, you meet acquaintances you didn't know were on board. There's the, the usual uncertainty as to whether the food will be good, bad, or indifferent until the first two meals have put the matter beyond doubt. And the usual uncertainty about the weather, of course, until the, the ship is fairly off Fire Island. The, the tables are crowded at first and then suddenly thinned. You know, Pale-faced people spring from their seats and precipitate themselves towards the door, and each old sailor breathes more freely as his seasick neighbour rushes from his side, leaving him plenty of elbow room and an unlimited command over the mustard. I mean, one passage across the, the Atlantic is very much like another, and we who cross it often don't make the voyage for the sake of novelty. I mean, to the majority of us, the, the most delightful moment of the day on board an ocean steamer is when we've taken our last turn on deck, smoked our last cigar and, having succeeded in tiring ourselves slightly, feel at liberty to turn in with a clear conscience. On the first night of the voyage, I, I felt particularly lazy and I, I went to bed in 105 rather earlier than usual. As I turned in, I was surprised to see that I, I was to have a companion, a portmanteau very like my own, lay in the opposite corner and in the upper berth was a neatly folded rug with a, a stick and an umbrella. I mean, I was frankly rather disappointed because I'd hoped to be alone. But I, I wondered who my roommate was to be. And before I'd been long in bed, in he came. He was, as far as I could see, a very tall man, very thin and pale, with sandy hair and whiskers and colourless grey eyes. I, he had about him, I thought, an air of rather dubious fashion, the sort of man that you might see in Wall Street without being able to precisely say what he was doing there. You know, the, the sort who frequents a cafe anglais, perhaps, who always seems to be alone and who drinks champagne. Or, or you might meet him on a race course and he'd never appear to be doing anything there either. You know? A little overdressed, a little bit odd. There are three or four of his kind on, on every ocean steamer. Anyway, I, I made up my mind that I, I didn't care to make his acquaintance and I went to sleep, noting to myself to study his habits in order to avoid him. You know, if he rose early, then I would rise late. If he went to bed late, then I would go to bed early. I, poor fellow, I, I really needn't have taken that trouble because I, I never saw him again after that first night in 105. I was sleeping soundly when I was suddenly wakened by a loud noise. To judge from the sound, my roommate must have sprung with a single leap from the upper berth to the floor. I heard him fumbling with the, the latch and bolt of the door, and then I heard his footsteps as he ran at full pelt down the passage, leaving the door open behind him. Now the ship was rolling a little, and I, I expected to hear him stumble or fall, but he ran as if he were running for his life. 
the door was swinging on its hinges, the, the motion of the vessel, and the, the sound was getting on my nerves. So I got up and shut it and groped my way back to, to my berth in the darkness. I went to sleep again, but I, I had no idea for, for how long on that occasion. When I woke, it was still quite dark, and I, I felt a disagreeable sensation of cold. It seemed to me that the air was damp, you, you know, the, the peculiar smell of a cabin which has been wet with seawater. I, I, I covered myself up as well as I could, and I, I dozed off again, framing complaints to be made to the steward the next day. I could hear my, my roommate turn over in the upper berth. He, he probably returned when I was asleep. Once I thought I heard him groan, and I presumed that he was seasick, which is no fun when one is down below. But then anyway, I, I dozed off again, and I slept till early daylight. When I woke up, the ship was rolling heavily, much more than on the previous evening, and it was very cold, unaccountably so for June. I turned my head, and I saw to my surprise that the porthole was wide open and hooked back. I believe I swore audibly I, I got up to shut it. As I turned back, I, I glanced up at the upper berth. The, the, the curtains were drawn close together, and I, I guessed that my companion had probably felt as cold as I had. He, he was also clearly still asleep. Now, as I felt that I'd slept enough, this seemed to be an excellent opportunity for avoiding him. So I, I got dressed at once, and I went on deck. The weather was warm and cloudy, I remember, with an oily smell on the water. It was seven o'clock as I came out. It's much later than I'd imagined. I came across the doctor who was taking his first sniff of the morning air himself. He was a, a young fellow, cheerful, happy-go-lucky chap with black hair and blue eyes, already inclined somewhat to the stout. Fine morning, I said by way of introduction. Well... He said, eyeing me with an air of ready interest. It's a fine morning and it's not a fine morning. I don't think it is much of a morning, actually. <laughs> no, perhaps not, I said. It's what I call fugly weather, said the doctor. Well, it was certainly very cold last night, I remarked. But then I found that the porthole was wide open all night and, and it was damp, too. Damp, he said. Whereabouts are you? 105. The doctor started visibly and stared at me. Well, so what's the matter? I asked him. No, nah, no, nothing, nothing. Yeah, right, lady, it's funny that everyone has complained of that room for the, the last three trips. Well, I'm tempted to complain too, I said. I, it's just not been aired properly. Yeah. Well, I, I believe that, 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 that can't be helped, said the doctor. But, well, it's not my business to frighten passengers. Well, you, you needn't be afraid of frightening me. I said, uh, and I can stand a bit of damp. If I, if I get a cold, I'll come to you. I offered the doctor a cigar. Yeah, it's not so much the damp, he remarked, taking a cigar, but I, I dare say that you'll be all right. Have you a roommate? Yes, I have. Juice of a fellow bolts out in the middle of the night and leaves the door swinging open. Again, the doctor glanced curiously at me. Then he lit his cigar and looked grave. Did he come back? He asked presently. Yeah. I don't know while I was asleep, but I, I woke up and I heard him moving about. And then I felt cold and went to sleep again. This morning, I, I found the porthole open. Look here, said the doctor quietly. I, I, I don't much care for the ship and I, I don't care a rat for her reputation. I'll tell you what I'll do. I've got a good sized place up here myself. I'll share it with you, even though I don't know you from Adam. <laughs> I was very surprised at this proposition. I, I couldn't imagine why this fellow should take such a, a sudden interest in my welfare, but, well, his manner as he spoke of the ship was, was peculiar. Well, you're, you're very kind, Doctor, I said, but really, I, I think the cabin just needs airing, cleaning out, something like that. What, what, why do you not care for the ship? Well, we're not superstitious in our profession, replied the Doctor, but the sea, well, you know, Tends to make people somewhat superstitious. I don't want to prejudice you, and I, I don't want to frighten you, but if you'll take my advice, please, move in with me. I, I, I'd as soon see you overboard as know that you or any other man was to sleep in 105 for another night. Good gracious, why, I said. Because on the last three trips, the people who've slept there actually have gone overboard, he answered gravely. 
I looked at the doctor to see whether he was making a game of me, but no, he, he looked perfectly serious. But I, I thanked him warmly for his offer, but I told him that I intended to be the exception to the rule by which everyone who slept in that particular cabin went overboard. And he, he didn't say much to that, but he, he looked as grave as ever, and he, he hinted that before we got across, I should probably reconsider his proposal. Well, after breakfast, I, I went back to my room to get a book. The curtains of the upper berth were still closely drawn and not a sound was now to be heard from them. My roommate was clearly still fast asleep. As I came out, I, I met the steward who whispered to me that the captain wanted to see me and then he scuttled away down the passage as if to avoid me asking many questions. So I went to the captain's cabin and I, I found him waiting for me. Ah, sir, yes, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, now, I, I'll get straight to the point. I have a favour to ask you. Well, I told him that I would do anything to oblige. Your roommate has disappeared, he said. He, he is known to have turned in early last night. I can I ask you, did you notice anything extraordinary in his manner? The question, coming as it did in exact confirmation of the fears that the doctor had expressed half an hour earlier, did take me by surprise. You don't mean to say he's gone overboard, do you? I asked. I fear he has, yes. Well, that is the most extraordinary thing, I began. Why? he asked. He's the fourth, then? I asked. And I explained, without mentioning the doctor, that I had heard the story concerning 105 and told him what had occurred in the night. The captain seemed annoyed. What you say, he said, can coincide almost exactly with what was told me by the roommates of two of the other three. They, they bolted out of bed and ran down the passage. Two of them were seen to go overboard by the watch. We stopped and lowered boats, but they were never found. Now, nobody, however, ever saw or heard the man who was lost last night, if, in fact, he is lost. I mean, the steward went to look for him this morning and, and found his berth empty, but his clothes were lying about just, just as he left them. And the steward was the only man on board to know him by sight, and he's been searching everywhere for him and found absolutely no sign. Now, sir, I want to beg you not to mention this to any of your fellow passengers. Obviously, I don't want the, the ship to get a bad name, and nothing hangs about an ocean liner worse than stories of suicides. You, you, you shall have your choice of any one of the officers' cabins that you like, including my own, for the rest of the passage. Now, is that a fair bargain? Well, very fair, Captain, I said, and I, I'm much obliged to you, but since I'm alone and have the room to myself, I... I I'd rather not move, if you don't mind. I mean, if the steward will take out that poor man's things, I, I'd, I'd sooner stay where I am. I, I, I shan't say anything about the matter, of course, and I think I can promise you that I, I will not follow my roommate's example. Well, the captain tried to dissuade me, but I, I preferred having a room alone to being the chum of any officer on board. I don't know whether I acted foolishly in that, but if I had taken the captain's advice... I'd have nothing more to tell you now. Either there'd have remained the disagreeable coincidence of several suicides by men who'd slept in the same cabin, but that would have been all. But that was not all. That was not all by any means. I made up my mind that I wouldn't be disturbed by these tales as I'd heard, and I, I went even so far as to argue the question with the captain. There was just something wrong with the room, I said. You know, it was damp, and the porthole had been left open last night. And the place really ought to be aired, and the, the fastening of the porthole looked to. If the captain would give me leave, I would see that I would do anything necessary that needed to be done. As for my erstwhile roommate, you know, he, he might have been ill and, and become delirious. You know, he might even now be hiding somewhere on board and, and be found quite safe later on. The captain frowned and said, of course, you, you, you have a right to stay where you are if you please, but I wish that you would just let me lock that place up and be done with it. And I explained that I did not see things in the same light, and I left him after again promising to keep silence about the, the disappearance of my companion. The, the, the latter had had no acquaintances on board the ship, and he was not missed in the course of the day. Towards evening, I, I met the doctor again, and he asked me whether I'd changed my mind, and I, I told him no, I 
I haven't changed my mind. Then you will before long, he said, very gravely, and turned away. Well, we, we played whist in the evening, and I went to bed late. I, I'll confess now that I, I did feel a, a disagreeable sensation when I, I entered my cabin. You know, I couldn't help thinking of the tall man I'd seen the previous night who was now dead, drowned, you know, tossing about in the long swell two or three hundred miles astern. His face rose very distinctly before me as I undressed, and I even went so far as to draw the curtains of the upper berth back to persuade myself that he was actually gone. I also bolted the, the door of the cabin, and suddenly I became aware that the porthole was open and fastened back. Now, that was more than I could stand. I threw on my dressing gown and I went in search of the steward. I was very angry with him. And I, I, when I found him, I, I practically dragged him to the door of 105 and, and pushed him towards the open porthole. What the hell do you mean by leaving the porthole open every night? I said to him. You know it's against the regulations. Good grief, if the ship healed and water began to come in, ten men couldn't shut it. You give me one reason now why I shouldn't tell the captain about this, here and now. The man trembled and turned pale, and then he began to shut the round glass plate with the, the heavy brass fittings. Well, come on, answer me, man, I said. If you please, sir, the steward faltered. There ain't nobody on board as can keep this here port shut at night. You know, no, you try it yourself, sir. If I was you, I'd clear out and go and sleep somewhere else. Now, look here, sir. Is that fastened? Is, is that what you would make all securely fastened or not, sir? Try it. You see if that will move an inch. Well, I tried the port and I found it to be perfectly tight. Well, sir, I'll wager with you that in half an hour it will be open again. Fastened back too, sir. That's the strange thing about it. It'll be fastened back too. Well, I examined the great screw and the looped nut that ran out of it. Right. Well, my good man, if I do find that open in the night... I'll give you a sovereign, all right? Now go. Very good, sir. Very good, thank you. Pleasant repose to you, sir. And all manner of enchanting dreams, too. And he scuttled away. Now, of course, I thought that he was trying to cover his negligence by a silly story, and I, I didn't believe him. But, well, the fellow got his sovereign. I went to bed. And five minutes after I'd rolled myself up in my blankets, the steward extinguished the light that burned behind the ground glass pane near the door. I lay quite still in the dark trying to get to sleep, but I just, oh, I couldn't do it. I mean, it had been some satisfaction being angry with the steward, I must say, and the, the diversion had banished the unpleasant sensation that I'd experienced when I thought of the drowned man who'd been my roommate. But I, well, the fact is, I was just no longer sleepy and, I lay awake, occasionally glancing at the porthole, which I could just see from where I lay, and which in the darkness looked like a faintly luminous soup plate suspended in blackness. I must have lain there for an hour, I think, and I was finally dozing to sleep when I was roused by a draught of cold air and the distinct feeling of sea spray in my face. I started to my feet, and not having allowed in the dark for the motion of the ship, I was instantly thrown violently across the cabin. I recovered myself and climbed to my knees, and I saw that the porthole was wide open and fastened back. Now, the, these things are facts, right? You know, I was wide awake when I got up, and I, I should certainly have been woken by the fall had I still been dozing. In fact, I, I bruised my elbows and knees pretty badly, and the bruises were there the next morning to testify to the fact. No, there's no doubt that the porthole was wide open and fastened back. You know, a thing so unaccountable that I remember feeling astonishment rather than fear when I first discovered it. Well, I closed it again, and I screwed down the loop nut with all my strength. I, I reflected that the, the porthole had certainly been opened within an hour after the steward had shut it in my presence, and I, I determined to watch it and see whether it would open again. I stood peering out through the, the thick glass at the alternate white and grey streaks of the sea that foamed beneath the ship's side. I must have remained there for a quarter of an hour. And suddenly... 
As I stood, I heard something moving behind me in one of the berths. And as I turned to look, though, of course, I, I, I couldn't see anything in the darkness, I heard a very faint groan. I sprang across the cabin and tore the curtains of the upper berth aside, thrusting in my hands to discover if anyone was in there. And there was someone. I remember that the sensation I had as I put my hands forward was as though I were plunging them into the air of a damp cellar. And from behind the curtain came a gust of wind that smelled horribly of stagnant seawater. I laid hold of something that had the shape of a man's arm, but it was smooth and wet and icy cold. And then suddenly, as I pulled at this, the creature sprang forward against me. It was a, a clammy, oozy mass, it seemed, and heavy and wet, yet endowed with a, a sort of supernatural strength. Well, I, I reeled back across the room, and in an instant, the door opened, and the thing rushed outside. I, I, I hadn't time to be frightened, and quickly recovering myself, I sprang through the door and gave chase at the top of my speed but I was too late. Ten yards before me, I could see, I'm sure that I saw it, a dark shadow moving in the dimly lit passage, quickly as the shadow of a horse thrown before a dog cart by the lamp on a dark night. But in a moment, it had disappeared. And I found myself holding on to the polished rail that ran along the bulkhead. My hair was standing on end. I did Cold perspiration rolled down my face. I was very badly frightened now. And yet still I, had, I doubted my senses. I, I pulled myself together. It was absurd, I thought. Well, that Welsh rabbit that I'd eaten had disagreed with me. It must have been a nightmare. I went back to my cabin and the, the, the whole place smelled of stagnant seawater, as it had done when I'd waked on the, the previous evening. It required my utmost strength to go in and grope among my things for a box of matches. As I lighted the railway reading lantern, which I always carry in case I want to read after the lamps are out, I perceived that the porthole was open again, and a sort of creeping horror began to take possession of me, which I'd never felt before, and pray that I never will again. And anyway, I, I got a light, and Proceeded to examine the upper berth, expecting to find it drenched with seawater. No. The bed had been slept in, and the smell of the sea was strong, but the bedding was dry as a bone. Now, I fancied that the steward had not had the courage to make the bed after the accident of the previous night, and they must have been just all a hideous dream. I, I drew the curtains back as far as I could, and I examined the whole place very carefully, and it was perfectly dry, but the portal was open again, with a sort of a dull bewilderment of horror. I closed it and I screwed it down and thrusting my heavy stick through the brass loop, I wrenched it with all my might until the thick metal began to bend under the pressure. And then I hooked my reading lantern into the red velvet at the head of the couch and I sat down to recover my senses. I sat there all night, unable to think of rest, hardly able to think of anything at all, but the porthole did at least remain closed. And I, I do not believe that I would open it again without the application of considerable force. Well, the morning dawned at last. I dressed myself slowly, thinking over everything that had happened in the night. I, it, it was a beautiful day when I got out on deck, glad to get out in the, the early pure sunshine and to smell the breeze so different from the stagnant odour of my cabin. Instinctively, I, I turned aft towards the surgeon's cabin, and there he was, pipe in mouth, taking his morning air precisely as he had done on the preceding day. Good morning, he said looking at me with evident curiosity. You were quite right, Doctor, I said. There's something wrong with that place. Bad night, eh? Shall I make you a pick-me-up? I, I got a capital recipe. <laughs> no, thank, thank you, Doctor, but I'd like to tell you what happened. 
and I then tried to explain as clearly as possible precisely what had occurred, not omitting to state that I had been very frightened, frightened as I'd never been in my whole life before. I dwelt particularly on the phenomenon of the porthole, which was a fact to which I could testify, even if the rest had been an illusion. I closed it twice in the night, I told him, and the second time I actually bent the brass in wrenching it with my stick. You seem to think that I, I'm likely to doubt the story, said the doctor. Well, I don't doubt it, not in the least, and I now renew my invitation to you from yesterday. Bring your traps here and take half my cabin. Well, why don't you come and take half of mine for the night, I countered. Help me get to the bottom of this thing. You'll get to the bottom of something else if you try, answered the doctor. Th then you won't help me find out. No, I will not. I'm sorry, sir. It, it, it is my business to keep my wits about me, not to go fiddling about with ghosts. Oh, come on, doctor. Do you have any other ideas? He asked. No, you do not. You say that you will find an explanation, sir. I say that you will not, because there is not an explanation to be found. Oh, come on, doctor. Do you, a man of science, really mean to tell me that such things cannot be explained? I do, he said stoutly. And if they could, I would not be concerned with the explanation. Well, I didn't care to spend another night alone in the room, but I was determined that I would get to the root of these disturbances. You know, I, I don't believe that there are many men who would have slept there alone after passing two such nights, but I made up my mind to try it if I could not get anyone to share the watch with me. Now, the doctor was evidently not inclined for such an experiment. He, he said that he was a surgeon, and if any accident occurred on board, he must always be in readiness. He couldn't afford to have his nerves unsettled. Well, perhaps he was right in that. He also assured me that there was no one else on board who would be likely to join me in my investigations, and after a little more conversation with him, I left. A little later, I met the captain and told him my story. I said that if no one would spend the night with me in the room, then I would ask leave to have the light burning all night and would try it all alone. Look here, said the captain after some thought. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll share the watch with you myself and we'll see what happens. Now, there, there may be some fellow skulking on board who steals a passage by frightening other passengers or it's possible that there may be something queer in the carpentering of that berth ah, i was overjoyed to hear this and i suggested that we take the ship's carpenter to the cabin to examine the place and, and so the captain sent for the workman and ordered him to do anything that i required and we went below with him at once i had all the bedding cleared out of the upper berth and we examined the place absolutely thoroughly to see if there was any board loose anywhere or a panel which could be opened and, and pushed aside. We, we tried the planks, tapping the flooring, unscrewed the fittings of the lower berth, took that to pieces. There was not a square inch of that cabin which was not searched and tested and everything was in perfect order. And we put it back in its place. The carpenter had done his work silently and skillfully, but when he'd finished, he spoke up. I'm a plain man, sir, he said. But it's my belief that you'd better just turn out your things and let me run half a dozen foreign screws through the door of this cabin. There's no good ever came here, sir. There's been four lives lost to my own remembrance, and that in four trips. Better give it up, sir. Better give it up. I'm going to try it one more night, I told him. Better give it up, sir repeated the workman, putting his tools in his bag and leaving the cabin. But my, you see, my own spirit had in fact risen considerably at the, the prospect of the captain's company. I, I abstained from Welsh rabbits and grog that evening, and I, I didn't even join in the customary game of whist. I, I wanted to be quite sure of my nerves, and, and my vanity did make me anxious to cut a good figure in the captain's eyes. He, he was one of those tough, cheerful specimens of seafaring humanity, the captain, who, whose combined courage, hardihood, and calmness in difficulty leads them naturally into high positions of trust. He, 
He wasn't the man to be led away by an idle tale, and the, the mere fact that he was willing to join me was proof that he thought that there was something seriously wrong, something in, in what I said. I and mean, to some extent, too, his own reputation was at stake, as well as the, the reputation of his ship. You know, it's no light thing to, to lose passengers overboard, and, and he knew that. About 10 o'clock that evening, as I was smoking a last cigar, he came up to me and drew me aside. This is a very serious matter, Mr. Brisbane, he said. And we must make up our minds either way, to be disappointed or to have a pretty rough night of it. Now, I can't afford to laugh at this affair, and I will ask you to sign your name to a statement of whatever occurs. If nothing happens tonight, we will try again tomorrow and then the next day. Are you ready, and do you agree? So we went below and entered the cabin. As we went in, I could see the steward a little further down the passage watching us as though certain that something dreadful was about to happen. The captain closed the door behind us and bolted it. Supposing we put your portmanteau before the door, he suggested. One of us can sit on it and then nothing can get out. Now, is the porthole screwed down? Well, I found it as I'd left it in the morning. Indeed, without using a lever, as I'd done to tighten it, no one could possibly have opened it. I drew back the curtains of the, the upper berth, lighted my reading lantern and placed it so that it shone on the white sheets above. The captain insisted on sitting on the portmanteau himself. And then he asked me to search the cabin thoroughly, an operation that was very soon accomplished as it consisted merely of looking beneath the lower berth and under the couch below the porthole and everything was quite empty. It's impossible for any human being to get in, I said, or for any human being to open the port. Very good, said the captain. If we see anything now, it must either be imagination or something supernatural. Well, I sat down on the edge of the lower berth. First time it happened, said the captain, crossing his legs and leaning back against the door, was in March. The passenger who slept here in the upper berth turned out to have been a lunatic. At all events, he, he was known to have been a little touched, and he had taken his passage without the knowledge of his friends. He rushed out in the middle of the night, threw himself overboard, before the officer who had the watch could stop him. I mean, we, we stopped and lowered a boat, but, it, well, it was a quiet night just before the, the heavy weather came on, but we, we couldn't find him. I mean, of course, his suicide was afterwards accounted for on the grounds of his insanity. I, I suppose that often happens, I remarked rather absently. No. No, not often at all. But never before in my experience, although I, I have heard of it on other ships. But as I was saying, that occurred back in March. On the very next trip, what are you looking at? He asked, stopping suddenly. I gave no answer. My eyes were riveted on the porthole. It seemed to me that the brass loop was beginning to turn very slowly upon the screw, so slowly that I, I wasn't sure that it moved at all. I watched it in Intently fixing its position in my mind and trying to ascertain whether it had changed. Seeing where I was looking, the captain looked too. It's moving, he said. Then after a minute, no. No, no, it's not. If it were the jarring of the screw, I said, it would have opened during the day. But I, I found it this evening jammed tight as I left it in the morning. I rose and I tried the nut and had loosened, because by an effort I could move it with my own hands. The queer thing, said the captain, is that the, the second man who was lost is supposed to have gone through that very porthole. He had a terrible time over it. It was in the middle of the night, and the, the weather was very heavy. The, there was an alarm that one of the ports was open and the sea running in. I came below, and I, I found everything in here flooded, the water pouring in. Every time she rolled and the whole port swinging from the top bolts, not, not the porthole in the middle. Well, I mean, we, we managed to shut it, but the, the water did some damage. And ever since then, the place smells of seawater from time to time. I mean, we supposed that the, the passenger had thrown himself out, though. How the hell he could have done that, I don't know. The steward kept telling me that he, he couldn't keep anything shut in here. 
Good grief, I, I can smell it now, can't you? <laughs> he sniffed the air suspiciously. Yes, I can, I said, distinctly. And I shuddered as that same odour of stagnant seawater grew stronger in the cabin. Now, to smell like this, the, the place must be damp, I said. And yet when I examined it with the carpenter this morning, everything was perfectly dry. It, it, it's absolutely... Hello. My reading lantern, which had been placed in the upper berth, was suddenly extinguished, although there was still a good deal of light from the pane of ground glass near the door behind which loomed the regulation lamp. The ship rolled heavily, and the curtain of the upper berth swung far out into the room and back again. I rose quickly from my seat on the edge of the bed, and the captain at the same moment started to his feet with a loud cry of surprise. I'd turned with the intention of taking down the lantern to examine it, when I heard his exclamation, and immediately afterwards his call for help, I sprang towards him, and he, he was he was wrestling with all his might with the, the brass loop of the porthole. I, it seemed to be turning against his hands in spite of all his efforts. I caught up my cane. It was a heavy oak stick. I always carry it with me. I thrust it through the ring and bore down on it with all my strength, and the wood snapped, and I fell upon the couch. When I rose again, the porthole was wide open and the captain was standing with his back against the door, pale to his lips. There's something in the berth, he said in a strange voice, his eyes almost starting from his head. Hold the door while I look. It shall not escape us, whatever it is. But instead of taking his place, I sprang to the lower bed and seized upon something which lay in the upper berth. It was something ghostly. Horrible beyond words, and it moved in my grip. It was, it was like the body of a man long drowned, and yet it moved. And, and it had the strength of ten men living. I, I gripped it with all my might, the slippery, oozy, horrible thing. The, the dead white eyes seemed to stare at me out of the dusk. The, the putrid odour of rank seawater was about it, and its shiny hair hung in foul, wet curls over its dead face. I wrestled with the dead thing. It thrust itself upon me and forced me back and nearly broke my arms. It, it wound its corpse's arms around my neck, the, the living death, and it, it overpowered me so that I at last cried aloud and fell and left my hold. And as I fell, the thing sprang across me and seemed to throw itself upon the captain. When I last saw him on his feet, his face was white and his lips set. It seems to me that he struck a violent blow at the dead being, and then he too fell forward upon his face with an inarticulate cry of horror. The thing paused an instant, seemed to hover over his prostrate body, and I could have screamed again for fright, but I had no voice left. It vanished suddenly, and it, it, it seemed to my disturbed senses that it made its exit through the open porthole, though how it was possible is more than anyone can ever tell. I lay a long time on the floor, and the captain lay beside me. At last I partially recovered my senses, and I instantly knew that my arm was broken, that the small bone of the left forearm near the wrist. I, I got myself to my feet somehow, and with my remaining hand I tried to raise the captain. He, he groaned and moved. And at last he came to himself. He wasn't hurt, but he was badly stunned. Well, what more do you want to hear? Nothing more. That's the story, I'm afraid. The carpenter carried out his scheme of running a half dozen four-inch screws to the door of the cabin. And if ever you take a passage on the Kamchatka today and ask for a berth in 105, you'll be told that it is engaged. And it is engaged. It's engaged by something dead. I finished my trip in the surgeon's cabin. He treated my arm and advised me not to fiddle about with any more ghosts. The captain was very silent and never sailed in that ship again, although it is still running. 
And I will never sell in her again either. Hmm. No, it, it was a it was a very disagreeable experience. I was very badly frightened, and I don't like that at all. But that is all. That is how I saw a ghost. If it was a ghost, it was dead anyhow. 